Thanks to Brilliant for sponsoring today's video. There's nothing better than a really simply stated math problem that has a somewhat complicated solution. It's always a little bit surprising. And that's exactly what we have here. So we're gonna look at the differential equation f prime of x equals f of one over x. So not only is this easy to state, but has kind of a complicated solution, but it's got this nice combination of a differential equation and then this sort of compositional aspect. We're composing one over x into the function f. Okay, so let's get started. So let's be inspired by the fact that if we compose the function one over x with itself, we get back to the identity to try to like build that into this situation. And we can do that by taking the derivative of this entire equation. And that'll give us f double prime of x. Well, that's obviously equal to the derivative of the derivative. But now let's write that derivative on the inside as f of one over x. We're, we're just using our differential equation. But now we can use the chain rule on this. And that'll give us the derivative of f evaluated at one over x times the derivative of one over x. So again, that's simply by the chain rule. But our differential equation over here is saying that if you take the derivative and plug something in, it's the same thing as taking the reciprocal and plugging it into the original function. That means we can replace this f prime of one over x with f of one over one over x. Okay, and then the derivative of one over x, well, I think that's well known, that is negative one over x squared. Okay, so one over one over x is clearly equal to just x, and that leaves us with the following differential equation. So we have f double prime of x starting here, equals minus one over x squared times f of x. Okay, so in other words, our solution, and when I say our solution, I mean our solution to this differential equation, must satisfy the following more traditional differential equation. Y double prime equals minus y over x squared, which is maybe more typically written as x squared times y double prime plus y equals zero. And that's because that's a so-called Cauchy-Euler differential equation, which you generally learn how to solve in a standard differential equations class. Okay, so let's take this exploration and see if we can find a solution to our original problem. If you're looking for a free and easy way to learn more about differential equations, check out Brilliant.org. Brilliant offers a wide range of topics for all skill levels, from beginner to advanced. Take a quick quiz and Brilliant will customize content to your interests and skill level, maximizing your time. What really makes Brilliant shine is its problem-solving approach. You won't just passively absorb information, you'll actively learn through hands-on interactive lessons that challenge your thinking and creativity. Brilliant is available on your phone, tablet, or computer, and Brilliant will support you every step of the way. No matter what skill level you're at, Brilliant can help you improve. Not sure where to start? They have introductory courses in a variety of STEM topics, from calculus, physics, computer science, logic, and more. Keep your love for learning alive with Brilliant's interactive lessons. It is really great for everyone. I recently worked through Kurzgesagt's course and it was great. But we're scientists here, so don't take my word for it. You should test it for yourself. Treat yourself to a unique hands-on experience by going to brilliant.org slash Michael Penn for a 30-day free trial. And the first 200 people will get 20% off their annual premium subscription. Thanks once again to Brilliant for sponsoring today's video. So in the last board, we proved that our functional differential equation had to satisfy a more standard differential equation, x squared, y double prime plus y equals zero. And we mentioned that that was a Cauchy-Euler differential equation. Let's also notice that it satisfies the following sort of semi-initial condition. It's not exactly an initial condition, but it's kind of close. 
and that is y prime of 1 equals y of 1. And that's because, notice that if you plug in x equals 1 here, you get f prime of 1 equals f of 1 over 1, but 1 over 1 is clearly 1, so that's why we get this second condition. Okay, so now let's go about solving for our original function, f. And I'm going to use a standard strategy of guessing the format of the solution and then showing that that actually gives us the solution. And here we're going to take inspiration, and here we're going to take inspiration from the simple power rule. In fact, we're going to use the fact that if we take the second derivative of x to the r, we get r times r minus 1 times x to the r minus 2. So that's just the power rule applied twice. But taking the second derivative and then multiplying by x squared will build this back up to the original um, power. But then taking the second derivative and multiplying by x squared will build us back up to the original power of x. And that's what we kind of want to use here. So we know that x squared y double prime plus y equals zero. But then if we plug in y equals x to the r, so that's like our guess solution, well, we're going to get something quite nice. Let's see what we get. So we'll have x squared times y double prime, but as we mentioned, that's this. So r times r minus 1 times x to the r minus 2. And then plus y, but that's simply x to the r equals 0. So we've got something like that. But that has to hold for all values of x. But since that has to hold for all values of x, we can simply extract the coefficient of x to the r. Notice that there's only a coefficient of x to the r here. That's the only power of x that we see. And that gives us a nice equation for r. And that looks something like this. We have r times r minus 1 plus 1 equals 0. So the r times r minus 1 comes from this first bit, and then obviously the 1 comes from that other bit. But that gives us a quadratic equation, r squared minus r plus 1 equals 0, which we can solve for r using the quadratic formula. So here we'll get r equals 1 half plus minus i times the square root of 3 over 2. So I'll let you do the calculation with the quadratic formula to get there if you need to, but I think that's pretty straightforward. Okay, nice. So that means if r is equal to either of those numbers, then our x to the r satisfies, well, this differential equation here, which puts us on track to have a solution to our original equation. That being said, what does it mean to have an imaginary exponent? In other words, x to the i times something. Well, let's uncover that. But before we do that, let's set each of these roots equal to something else. So let's set r1 equal to, well, 1 half plus i times root 3 over 2. And we'll set r2 equal to the other one. So we have 1 half minus i times the square root of 3 over 2. And so we kind of expect our solution to be written as c1, where that's a constant, times x to the r1 plus c2 times x to the r2. Just like keeping in mind the standard rules for differential equations, like here we've got a homogeneous differential equation, which means that we should have some sort of linear combination of the two solutions. Of course, that is only for this differential equation over here, not for our original equation. We'll have to deal with that at the end. Okay, so let's maybe look at x to the r1, uncover what that really looks like, and then we'll have a similar formula for x to the r2. So here we have x to the r1. Well, that's going to be x to the 1 half plus i times the square root of 3 over 2. But I'm going to write that as the square root of x. That's from my x to the half. And then I'm going to write that as e to the i times the square root of 3 over 2 times the natural log of x. So that's our x to the i times 
root three over two. Oh, but now I've got a complex exponential. Actually, it's just an imaginary number inside of the exponential. But by Euler's formula, I know exactly how to expand that. So let's do that. That becomes the square root of x, and then we'll have cosine of square root of three over two times natural log of x plus i times sine of square root of three over two times natural log of x. So that's my x to the r1. And then very, very similarly, we have x to the r2 is equal to the square root of x times, well, it's gonna be essentially the same thing, except we've got a minus sign in front of the i sign. So we've got this. Okay, great. But now it would be maybe more typical to choose c1 and c2, those arbitrary constants built into the solution, so that we can combine the cosine term in each of these and the sine term in each of these. So let's do that. So let's write it down here. So let's choose C1 and C2, making this happen. So we'll have Y equals the square root of X. That'll be in front of everything. And then we'll have A times cosine of root three over two times the natural log of x plus b times sine of root three over two times the natural log of x. I think that's a nicer general form than what we had before. Okay, so let's maybe bring that up and then we'll impose this second condition. Notice we've only imposed this first condition. So the first condition over here implied that our function had to have the following form. And now we're gonna impose this second condition, that f prime of one must be equal to f of one. But that means we need to take the derivative of this thing, so let's do that carefully. Notice that we can use the product rule because we've got the square root of x times all of that stuff. But inside we'll have to use the chain rule because we've got this root three over two natural log inside of each of the trig functions. Okay. So anyway, we need to be careful. So f prime of x will be equal to, well, one over two square root of x. That's from taking the derivative of the first bit. And then we'll just bring down all of the rest. So a cosine root three over two times natural log of x plus b sine times root three over two natural log of x. Good. And now that'll be all added to the square root of x times, well, whatever's inside. So let's see what's inside, well, after we take the derivative, of course. So for the derivative of this cosine term, carefully using the chain rule, we'll have negative a times root three over two times x times the sine of that stuff. So we'll have root three over two natural log of x. Okay, that's because the derivative of natural log is one over x. The derivative of cosine is negative sine. Now we'll have something similar over here. So we'll have plus b times root three over two x times the cosine of root three over two times the natural log of x. Okay, nice. But now what I'd like to do is evaluate f of x at one and f prime of x at one. So let's see what that leaves us with. So f, evaluated at one is, well actually this simplifies a lot because the natural log of one is zero, we get the cosine of zero which is one and the sine of zero which is zero. So this simplifies down to, well just simply the number a. And then let's see what we get for f prime of one. So we're gonna get still quite a bit of simplification. So notice that the sine term cancels here, the sine term cancels here, and from this bit we'll have a over two, so we have a over two, and then from this bit we'll have, let's see, root three times b over two. Okay, good. But now equating these two, we can easily solve for a in terms of b, and you'll see that a must be equal to root three times b. But that means we have our final solution. Notice that f of x must be of the following form. 
it is some constant b times the square root of x. So it still depends on a constant. It still has an arbitrary constant attached. And then it'll be root three times cosine of root three over two natural log of x plus sine of root three over two times natural log of x. And there we have it. We have solved this nice functional differential equation to get this down here. So if you're still here and you haven't subscribed yet, maybe consider subscribing. It would really help us out. And that's a good place to stop.